today comes from Psalm 68, a Psalm of David, verses 4 through 6. Sing to God, sing praises to his name. Lift up a song to him who rides through the deserts. His name is the Lord, exalt before him. Father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. God settles the solitary in a home. He leads out the prisoners for prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a parched land. morning we'll stand together and worship in song we've got two this morning so back to back we'll be singing two <laughs> with us. We are one big family. Um, we are all different, um, many different people in here, different personalities, but we are God's children and he loves each one of us and we're here to worship him and give him glory this morning. So we want to welcome you to church today. If you are with us by Facebook or YouTube, we say welcome to you as well and we're glad that you're joining us um, by that means today. We want to look at our announcements for the week. Today, the Family Life Center is going to be reserved. The basketball outreach dinner is at 6 p.m. 
So those that participated in basketball, we want them to come and join that. On Friday night is going to be a movie night featuring the blind on Friday at 7 p.m. This is a great family friendly night filled with fellowship, popcorn, and drinks are going to be provided. So mark your calendars and join us for the movie night Friday. And that will be in the Family Life Center. There's going to be a nursery volunteer meeting that is going to take place next Sunday, April 21st, following the service to complete the nursery schedule for May through July. We are also in need of one volunteer each Sunday for the remainder of April. So if you're able to help fill that spot, just contact the church office and let them know. Softball season is going to be starting up soon, and there is going to be a meeting next Sunday, a softball meeting slash practice at 4 p.m. here at the church. So if you're interested in being part of softball playing, um, please come and attend that meeting. And there's also going to be some upcoming info about um, help that's going to be needed volunteers for concessions for getting the field ready many different areas where we could use help so if that's something that you think you can do please let us know and we will gladly put you to work <laughs> you Kayla you okay come on all right we are going to move into our tithes and offerings so I'll ask the ushers to come to the front
spirit that is with us always in every place that we are and everything that we're doing god i just thank you for your holy spirit that abides with us lord i thank you this morning for your goodness you are a good god lord who is wanting good for us and you are always near lord but it's us that oftentimes um, push you away or separate from you and fail to walk closely with you, fail to stay committed to your word and reading and studying and praying, God. And I just pray this morning that we will just all have that close relationship with you, God, because you are our strength when we're weak. Lord, you're there with us every step of the way when we're dealing with trials and tribulations, God. We can't fight the battles of this world alone, Lord, and I just thank you that you're there with us to push us, to encourage us, to strengthen us, and to just give us a hope for each day, for our future, Lord. Lord, we just continue to lift up those that have been mentioned this morning, the names that were spoken. We thank you this morning for the praise report for Jessica. And God, we just ask that you continue to be with those that are on our prayer list, our family, our friends, our shut-ins. We pray for things that are going on around our world, for Israel, Lord. We just lift up the people of Israel to you today. And God, I just pray that you will be with us as we go out into our daily lives this week. Help us not to just be here on Sunday morning to worship, but to go out and to worship throughout the week, to look for ways, for little things to praise your name, um, to just remain positive, God. Life is so much better when we're positive when we find joy and I just pray that you'll do that for us this week and that we can seek ways to shine your light in the places that we go we love you Lord and we thank you for loving us Lord we thank you for your mercy that never fails us these things we ask in your precious name amen
Kids can go ahead and be dismissed for junior church. It's channel four, aux four. It's not very. Well, if you have your Bible with you this morning, go ahead and grab it, and we're going to turn with me to the book of James, the epistle written by James, a letter uh, written to the diaspora, or the dispersion, as he called it, uh, and, and as we continue in our series in the book of James, by the, uh, that we've called Faith Works, uh, James, of course, being the brother of Jesus, and he wrote this to really believers everywhere, and it's got something applicable for us today. And last week we did something that I've never done before, and I hope you enjoyed being able to read through an entire book uh, of the Bible as we uh, made our way through James. And we won't do that again uh, anymore uh, this, this time around. This is the first time I've ever done that, but uh, we are going to uh, cover verses 2 through 18 this morning as we continue in the series. You know, one of the things that really, um, what's the word, grinds my gears, annoys me, and probably annoys you as well. I don't really like to start my sermons off that way, but I'm sure all of us have felt this way at one time or another, is when someone tries to give us advice that's never actually done the thing that we're doing. Uh, it, it, let me just give you a for instance. Uh, uh, last year, uh, especially around Little League uh, Baseball, uh, a town in New Jersey actually came up with a good way to cause parents who had uh, were arguing with the umpire or argumented with the umpire in Little League, they came up with a good punishment. They said, look, if you're going to argue with the umpire, then you are going to have to umpire at least five games yourself to figure out exactly uh, what this is all about. And, and see, this is the thing. We do that. We argue with the umpire. And unless you've ever umpired before, Craig, right, you don't know what it actually is like until you've actually umpired. And the, you've got somebody breathing down your neck. You have somebody yelling at you. Listen, I umpired for softball last year, and I don't, or two years ago, and I don't ever want to do that again because it's hard, right? People argue with you, and they think they know better. They think they know that call better than you did, and so they argue with you. And, and that really gets on my nerves, and, and I, I think it gets on most of our nerves when someone is trying to tell us something about what, what we're going through or what we're doing. And this is especially true when we're going through something difficult or something hard. You know, I remember a little over two years ago, when Bobby Grady passed away. That was a, a great loss. A, well, probably one of the first times in our church that I really felt a collective mourning because I was very close with Carol. I was very close with Bobby. And, and I was there when he breathed his last breath. And, and I remember Carolyn in that time looking at me and asking me, why? Why would this happen? And I had no words for her. 
Because I, 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 I'm lucky enough to still have my spouse, Megan. Now, she's not here today because Lucy's sleeping, but I'm lucky enough to have her. And so if I were to say something like, oh, it's going to get better, and listen, this is the stuff that Carolyn heard, I'm sure, and I'm sure that if you've lost someone in your life, you've heard this. Oh, it's going to get better. You just have to pray. You, you just have to, uh, just, it, uh, you know, time is going to heal all wounds. You, and you hear these kind of platitudes, and they feel disingenuous from people who haven't been there. You, you get what I'm saying this morning? When, when we feel those things, uh, and we hear those things from people that have never been there, or never done that, feels just disingenuous, and I'm going to be honest with you this morning, as we approach the passage that we are, that I'm going to preach this morning, I feel it would be disingenuous for me to stand up here and say that I know what you're going through, or I feel the trial or tribulation that you are going through, because guess what, today's passage is going to talk about trials, it's going to talk about, to, uh, it's going to talk about going through a hard season, going through things in our life, and I feel like for me to stand up here and say, hey, I understand what you're going through. I understand you just need to do this or do that, and you'll get through that hard time. I feel it would be disingenuous. And if I can be honest this morning, I, I'm blessed. I've lived a blessed life to this point. I, I guess I've lost my grandfather and my grandmother, but pretty much everyone in my life is, is together. My, my parents are, are still together uh, after 20, uh, over 20-some 20 years of marriage. Uh, my, my family, is, uh, you know, I, I've lived a blessed life. I haven't gone through a ton of trials in my life. And for me to stand up here and to talk about your trials, to talk about the thing you're going through this morning, I feel would be disingenuous. But don't we for a second think that because I maybe can't know what you're going through, that God doesn't know? And that because I don't know what you're going through, it doesn't mean that James has not gone through some of these things. Aren't we grateful for our God that writes letters like this from people like James to be able to talk about the things that we go through? So as we read this letter this morning, as we read this first part of the letter, I want you to really hear what James is trying to say. And we're actually going to find out that James is the perfect person to talk about trials and tribulations. Let's stand together this morning as we honor the reading of God's Word. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 18. This is God's very Word to us. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. But that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. But the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. The desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits creatures. This is God's word. May he add its blessing to our heart to say, you may be seated. See, James here introduces kind of a crazy statement in the beginning. And he's going to really use this first chapter and, and the first verses here, verses 2 to 18, to introduce 
many of the themes that he's going to be talking about in the book. In fact, if we were to just look very briefly at verses 5 to 8, we see that he's talking here about wisdom. Let, if anybody lacks wisdom, let him ask, and, and God will give it to him. And in fact, he's going to talk more at length about wisdom in chapter 3. We also see in verses 9 through 11 that he talks about partiality, this idea of rich people being better than poor people, and how the gospel really flips that idea on its head, and we see that he's actually going to talk about that further in the next chapter, chapter 2. We see in this opening paragraph, this opening verse, he really sets the tone for what he's going to talk about for the next, what we are going to talk about for the next several weeks, and what he's going to talk about in his letter. But he does so under the umbrella of a controversial statement. This is maybe one of the most controversial statements, if I could be so bold as to say that, that I find in the Scriptures. It's one of the most controversial statements. And it's found in verse 2. Look at it. Count it all joy, my brothers, and may I add sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds. The controversial statement that James is going to make today and that we need to look at and we need to figure out is trials can be considered joyous, ludicrous, preposterous, James. That is insane for me to think that when I'm going through a trial, when I'm going through something that is hard, when I'm going through something that is difficult, when I lose a spouse, when I, when I do go through hard things, I lose my job, I, I get a, a cancer diagnosis, when I get a, a diagnosis from a doctor that's not good, when I go through hard things in my life that I consider, can consider that or count that joyous, feels a lot like the kind of advice that you would get from a guy who hasn't been there and done that. You, 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 sounds like that platitude. Hey, you, you, you're going through a trial? Oh, just, just, just be happy. <laughs> you're going through a hard thing? J just count it joy. I mean, when you consider it in the grand scheme of things, right? You can consider it joy. Trials can be considered joyous. That feels, to me, disingenuous. It feels like advice that I would receive from someone who hasn't been there or done that. And yet, we see... James, the brother of Jesus, was no stranger to trials and tribulations in his life. In fact, we see in this very letter the idea that he was a part of trials and part of tribulations when he t talks about sending this letter to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. See, this is a reference back to the book of Acts. You see, in James was one of the leaders of the early church. He, he rose to prominence very quickly, as, uh, obviously, as the brother of Jesus. I mean, he's Jesus' brother, after all. And so why don't we give him a platform to talk about? He knew Jesus and walked with Jesus and learned all the things about what Jesus had done. So let's give him a prominent place in the church. And we, we read in Acts, in, in Acts um, the, towards the end of Acts, in the 20s, we read about how that church that James was the leader of, James was the pastor of, went through trials and tribulations. In fact, there was a huge famine in Jerusalem, and they had to literally uproot themselves and leave and go and, and be dispersed. That's the, what the dis dispersion is all about. He had gone through trials. He had seen people in his life that he loved. Stephen, who was one of his deacons, one of the guys in his church, he watched him be stoned to death. He had gone through trials and tribulations in his life. In fact... What we may qualify him even more to speak on trials and speak uh, to our trials this morning is how he died. See, James never took back his preaching of the gospel. And in those times, there was a great persecution that arose. In fact, uh, many of the Jewish leaders of the time blamed the famine in Jerusalem on the church. And they said, the leaders of this church need to stop preaching the gospel, need to stop talking about Jesus, and, and he never once did. So finally, the Jewish leaders said, guess what? We're going to threaten this guy. So we're going to take him up to the top of the temple, and we're going to threaten to throw him off unless he recants the, the name of Jesus, unless he t takes all the stuff that he said back. And they were hoping to make a public display of the main leader, and James never did. And so what did they have to do? They threw him off the temple. And he fell down to the bottom of the temple, 
and yet he did not die. I mean, that talk about a trial, a physical trial. It, just because he was loving Jesus, just because he was doing what Jesus wanted, he got pushed off this, this t- tall temple. And he didn't die. And yet, instead of complaining, instead of he considered it joy in the midst of that trial to look up to those Pharisees who were standing on that temple and to look around at the people around him and to pray for them. Father, they don't know what they're doing, praying for them. And so he began to be stoned by the Pharisees who were standing around. And finally, someone took a club and bashed him over the head, bashed his head in, all because he would not recount or recant Jesus. Never renounce his faith. See, James knew what it was to stand in the midst of trial. In fact, if I had could take a little sidebar here, I, I have to say that it's amazing that James, the brother of Jesus, had faith in Jesus enough to give his life for it. And I guess even if you grew up with him, if your brother dies and publicly dies, is torn to shreds, put in a grave, and then three days later comes out of that grave, it, it, it tends to, uh, you know, change your opinion of that person. And, and it is one of the greatest evidences of the resurrection and one of the greatest evidences of the Christian uh, of Christianity being a real thing is that Jesus' own family died for him. And so here's the thing this morning. I cannot speak to the trial that you're going through. And maybe James can't speak to the exact trial that you're going through. But trials can be considered joyous. And we have to know that this morning. We have to know that truth. We have to chew on that truth a bit. You might say, Andrew, I I can't get there quite yet. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't understand my life. And and I'm going to tell you, I don't. But what I do know is what the Scriptures say. And the Scriptures tell us that when we face trials, and it tells us what kinds of trials, various. You know what that means? Any hard thing that we go through. It doesn't just mean persecution because of your faith, which... If we can be real honest this morning, we really don't face all that often. We like to think we are persecuted for our faith. In Goldsboro, North Carolina, we really don't face all that much persecution. We come up with things, but really we have it pretty nice and easy, and we've gotten, if I can be so bold as to say, very comfortable in our faith. But it's not just talking about persecution. It's talking about any trial. What, 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 what do you mean, Andrew? You mean... Like, I, I bombed my, my, uh, my final exam. Yeah, that's a trial. It's various, right? Well, what do you mean, Andrew? You mean my, my, my son or daughter, they, they have, have really g- given up on, on this whole Christian thing and have moved on and are, are living a, just a licentious life? Yeah, uh, that's a various trial. What do you mean, Andrew? I, I just got a diagnosis from my, from my doctor that, that is less than favorable. You mean that trial? Yes, that trial. Every variety of trial can be counted as joy. And that is what is so preposterous this morning. And James is going to try to prove it to us in many different ways. And the first way he's going to prove it to us is found in verses 2 through 4. Let's read it again. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. You see, whatever trial that you're going through this morning, whatever thing in your life that's a hardship, whatever thing in your life that God has put there in your life as a hardship for you, can be counted as joy because God uses trials in the life of believers to produce steadfastness and maturity. See, trials test our faith. And when they test our faith, they produce in us steadfastness. Now this word steadfastness, it's not a word we use all that often. What does it mean to be steadfast? Well, it means to be, uh, I think, immediately of, of another verse that talks about being steadfast, being immovable. The idea is patient. The idea is endurance. The idea here is, is this, uh, just being able to face over and again, uh, having this fortitude, having Being a strong person, that's the idea here. It produces in us a strength that maybe we didn't even know that we had in our life. 
when we go through various trials, when we go through tribulations, when we go through things in our life, it can produce in us an endurance, a strength that maybe we didn't know that we had. And God uses trials in our life to produce in us this patience, this fortitude, this perseverance. You know, this, this feels very similar uh, to w- when we w- want to train for a marathon. Now, some of you, you're, you're beyond training for a marathon, okay, let's just be honest, right? Maybe you can do the 5K, the turkey trot, or something like that, but, but if we train for a marathon, right, if we're, we're going to go and do a marathon, which I would love to do one day, I've never actually done it, I actually used to love to run, uh, obviously I'm not a runner anymore, I uh, probably need to get back to that, but I love to run, and, and I imagine that today, if I were to say, hey, hey I'm going to go and do a marathon after this, you'd probably all laugh at me, right? I've, I've done no training. I haven't run in a while, right? <laughs> uh, other than to the fridge, uh, if you want to be, if I want to be real honest, all right? Uh, I haven't run in a while, right? Uh, other than basketball and different things like that. So for, for me to say I'm going to go and, and do a marathon, uh, I mean, that would be insane, right? I'm going to face this, this marathon t- this afternoon. I'm going to run uh, this many miles, and I would die. I mean, let's just be honest. You'd have to find a new pastor for next week because I would be dead at the end of this marathon. But if I actually say, hey, look, I want to do a marathon, and I choose a marathon, maybe towards the end, let, let's be real, uh, towards the end of the year, okay? <laughs> uh, towards the end of the year, and I say, you know what? I want to build up my endurance to go ahead and do this marathon. I want to build up my fortitude. I want to build up those, those running muscles, my lungs. I, I, I want to build up. Uh, the, what, do, what would I do to do that? I mean, I can't do it sitting on the couch. What would I do? I would go out. And I would daily run. And I would put myself under these, it, it, I mean, we can just call it, we, I put myself under trials, under tribulations, right? I'd work my body to a place where then I can face that marathon, where I can face that marathon. And see, here's the thing this morning. This is what James is telling us. Those things that you're going through, the trials and tribulations that you're going through, they are producing in you a steadfastness, an endurance to be able to face anything in your life. They're producing in you a steadfastness that will be able to let you uh, face anything in your life. And when we, in this, are producing this endurance, endurance does something. Look at verse 4. It says, let steadfastness or endurance have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. See, what... James is trying to tell us this morning is that when we look at our trials as a thing that's producing in us endurance, when it's producing in us some kind of thing that's going to push us forward, that it's actually going to make us have a more dependence on God for being perfect and complete. Now, this is not talking about moral perfection. It's not talking about being a, a perfect person. Listen, there's no perfect person. If you're perfect, please leave, okay? Because uh, because today, um, I'm going to mess you up, all right? If you stick around long enough, you're gonna, I'm going to rub off on you. I'm going to mess you up. So leave, or, or you can come and preach too. That would be wonderful. We'd love to know how you're perfect. But we are not going to be perfect this side of heaven. But what this is talking about is that it begins to produce in us the things where we can realize and get a taste of this idea of shalom. Peace, wholeness. You see, many of us, we look at our trials and tribulations as something that happened to us, something outside that, 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 is, that is a problem to fix. But guess what? The trials and tribulations and those of us who have, have faced them and worked, worked through them, we understand that they become part of us, that they become part of who we are. The things that you have done in your past, the, the things that you have gone through, they have started to define who you are as a person and started to give you fortitude and endurance and, and, tr- and started to make you into a more sympathetic, empathetic person. It's why it, this league in New Jersey made their parents be umpires. Because when they went through and experienced it themselves, they began to become more empathetic towards the plight of the umpire. You see, this is what God does for us in trials. He, he redeems our trials to produce in us something that makes us who he wants us to be. Count it joy, my brothers, 
when you meet trials of various kinds. Why? Because God can use trials in your life to produce steadfastness and maturity. You see, trials can be considered this way because of what they produce in us, but really, they show us something that we need. They show us a great need in our life, specifically that we need God. And specifically, we need God's wisdom. Look there at verse 5 with me. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind, for that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. See, not only does the trial, does God use the trial to produce steadfastness and, and maturity in us, God also can give us wisdom in the face of trials. God also can give us wisdom in the face of trials. And, and, and we look at verses 5 to 8, it tells us really how we should ask for this. You know, we, we, God is not scared of our questions. Can I just tell you that this morning? I think some of us have been raised to, to never question God, to, to just say, no, God, you, you know, I'm just going to just walk through life, and, and He's all-powerful, He's all—I can never question God. But can I tell you that the entire Scripture is, uh, is filled with questions. Read the Psalms sometime. Why have you forsaken me, O oh God? Why have you let me go through this thing? God is big enough to handle our questions this morning. And when we ask, we, we ask in faith, God will give us an answer to that question. This is what he's saying. Look, you might like lack wisdom of why you're going through this trial. You might lack wisdom of, of what God is doing through this trial. But if you want to have that wisdom, it says, let him ask God who will give generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But here's the problem. Many of us don't want, really want the answer to that question. We don't want to know why we're going through the trial. That's why we doubt. That's why we be, he says, look, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. For, because you actually should probably want the, the answer to this. Don't be double-minded. Don't think, okay, I, I'm going I'm to ask God for wisdom to know why I'm going through this trial. No, but really I don't want the answer. It reminds me a lot of a question that I get quite often as, as a husband who uh, my wife asks me a question. She doesn't want my opinion. She doesn't really want to hear what I have to say. She really, what she wants is for me to parrot back what, she, what, I've already, what she's already said to me, right? She doesn't want to hear my opinion, but we do that with God all the time. We, we ask God questions that we don't really want the answer to. God, why am I going through this trial? Why am I facing this hardship? Why did you make me this way? God is big enough for our questions. God's big enough to give us those answers to those questions. See, trials help us understand that we need God, that we need His wisdom. We need to hear from Him. Some of us, we go through our life, and some of us have lived a really privileged life, and that's wonderful. I'm, I'm grateful to God for the life that I live. I've, I've been able to live. I haven't faced huge trials in my life yet. But some of us that have done that, we walk through our life, thinking we've got it all together, thinking we don't need God, thinking that, that we can just do whatever we want, that we are wise, that we can uh, figure things out on our own. It's when we're, we go through that trial that we understand, man, I, maybe I don't know everything. Maybe I don't understand perfectly what God does all the time. Maybe I am weak. You know, one of the main ways that we do this, one of the main ways that, that we uh, think that we're wise is, is found, uh, if you look with me, in verse 9. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, and the rich in his humiliation. Because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Here's what he's saying to us this morning. Some of you, and some of you that are listening to this, some of us that, that have read this, are, are thinking that we're wise, and we think we've got it all together, and that we can fix whatever trial or tribulation or thing that we go through simply by matter of our means. Simply by matter of what we have. Simply by matter of, of our riches. And that's what he's saying. Look, 
if you're in a trial, let a lowly brother, right, let him boast that he, he's being brought up to, to, to face this trial, but let the rich be humiliated or, or to boast in the humiliation, to understand that, that my riches can't fix every problem. Our m- money cannot fix every problem that you have in your life. Can it make things a little bit easier? Sure. I would be very disingenuous to, 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 to not say that. But can it fix every problem? Can it, can it get rid of all that cancer in your body? Can it overcome your addiction? Can it fix the things that you're going through in your life? Can it bring someone back from the dead? No. So the wisdom that we may have is that maybe we've been trusting in our own strength to make it through a trial. And some of us, we've been facing a trial for a long time in our life. Maybe we're a lot like the Apostle Paul who said he had this thorn in his flesh and it constantly came up over and over again. And we've been thinking and dealing with it in our own strength. Thinking, hey, I can just fix this. Hey, and we've never actually given that trial over to God, never actually asked God for wisdom to deal with the trial, never asked God for wisdom of why we were going through that trial. Some of us this morning are lacking in wisdom because we're too proud to ask for it. God wants to give us the wisdom to face the trial. And he can give us wisdom in the face of the trial that you're going through this morning. And I... I find no better example of this very thing than my own son, Ezra. That little boy is one of the most proud little kids. Hmm. Some, uh, sometimes, I, I, um, I'm not going to say that, but sometimes uh, I beat him, in, not beat him like this, but beat him in a game or beat him in basketball or something like this just so that he realizes how he actually is, what his skill level actually is. Because if not, if I just let him go unchecked, he thinks he's the best basketball player that ever lived. I mean, better than Michael Jordan. He thinks he's the best baseball player that ever stepped on, on, onto a, a diamond. In fact, just, just two days ago, we had practice. He had, he had practice. We, uh, he's playing on an 8U team in Little League. And he told me after that practice, he said, Dad, I'm one of the best ones on my team. Am I, am I right? I'm one of the best ones on my team. I said, no, buddy, you're not. <laughs> You're six years old, and, and some of those kids on that team are seven and eight, and they've been playing a couple years, and you're not the best one on your team. But he thought, just by virtue of, of him watching the practice and seeing what was going on, that he was one of the best ones. Now, can I tell you, he's a big kid. He's six years old. He's a big kid. He has potential. Can he be good? Yeah, sure. But he's going to have to build that potential, but he's not the best on the team. And I had to make him realize, look, you're not the best. And sometimes in our life, God brings things into our life to help us understand, to humble us to a place where we understand, man, I'm not the best. I can't fix this issue. To where we can have total dependence on Him. That's what God wants. And that is wisdom for us. To look at God and say, I am not God. You are. I need you. So trials can be considered a joy because... First of all, they produce in us something good. They produce in us maturity. They produce in us steadfastness. They can also be considered good because God gives us wisdom and discernment and even dependence on Him in the face of trials. Which brings us to the final thing. And and some of you, I've been feeling this this whole time. I, I know what you've been feeling this whole time. Why would God even allow trials in the first place? Why does he let me go through this thing? Why does he let, why do good things, or bad things happen to good people, and good things seem to always happen to bad people? God, are you even good? Are you even good? I mean, you, you're, you say you're good, and we talk about the goodness of God in our life, and yet we go through so many hardships, and go through so many trials, and it feels like, if I can just be honest this morning, it feels like sometimes in our churches, we're, we're hurting even more than, than in the outside world. It feels like there's, there's more sickness, or more, more death, or more things in our church than there is in the outside world, and sometimes we look at that and we say, God, how could you let that happen? How could you let something like this happen to a leader like James who was thrown off a pinnacle? How could you let something like that happen? 
man, are you even good? We may begin to question the goodness of God, but here's the reality this morning. Trials are not a thing that pushes away from God. In fact, they reveal something about God's character. Look at verses 12 to 15 with me. Look at it. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. The desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. See, what James is revealing to us this morning is something about God's nature. God is, is a good God who does not tempt us to evil. He's a good God that does not bring things in our life simply to push us away from Him. In fact, every trial and tribulation in our life that is brought from the outside in is a, a thing that's meant to build our endurance, build our faith. But what we see here is a trial or a tribulation that's brought on by our own stupidity, that's brought on by our own sinful desires, that's brought on by our own lustful desires. He says, look, God, God is not going to tempt you to, to sin. He's not, he can't be tempted. You can't look at him and be like, oh yeah, I'm tempting God to, uh, for faith. And, and listen, I, I, I've tried to do this before. I've been like, God, if you're real, then I, I told this story before. I was sleeping in my, my basement bedroom as a teenager, and I said, and there was a cricket that just would not stop uh, chirping, chirp, 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 chirp. I said, God, if you're real, you make that cricket stop. And guess what? He never made the cricket stop. Because God can't be tempted. God can't be tempted by me. He can't, he, I, I can't say, God, you're going to do this. But also, God does not tempt us. He doesn't look at us and say, hey, I'm going to push you into, into this sin. I'm going to put you in a situation where you have to lie. I'm going to put you in a situation where you have to, have, have to uh, sin in some way. God cannot also tempt either. What does it tell us in verse 14? It tells us each person is tempted when he or she is lured and enticed by their own desire. The desire, when it's conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. He says, look, some of the trials and tribulations in your life are not simply things that you're trying, God trying to build faith in you. There's things that you brought into your life because of your own selfish desires. John says this very thing in 1 John chapter 2. He says, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. You see, temptations are brought into our life not by, not by, by God, but by our own sinful desires. And these temptations, when they bring forth sin, bring forth trials in our life. Many times, trials in our own life are messes that we've made ourselves. Are messes that we brought on ourselves. You've heard the phrase, you've made your bed, now you have to lie in it. This is what James is saying here. Look, I, I, I know, be, know better example than if I tell Ezra to not touch a hot stove and he does it anyway, whose fault is it that he touched the hot stove? It's not my fault. It brought in, it, it was something that he wanted to do and he did it, and guess what? He's going to get burned. Listen, we do this all the time with God. God tells us, don't do that thing. Don't overeat. And yet, just last night, we eat an entire sleeve of Oreos. I'm speaking, look, I'm speaking from experience, okay? And we wake up this morning with a stomachache and we realize that's a trial that God did not put on me. That's a trial I put on myself because I ate the entire sleeve of Oreos. God tells us, don't have sexual relations with anyone outside of a one-on-one -on -one marriage covenant. And yet we do it, and we wonder why our relationship is crap. God tells us, let your eyes look on no evil thing. Set no evil thing before your eyes, and yet we look time and time again at, at movies and at, at things that are made to, 
that, that are, are not meant to be put in front of our eyes, we look at it and we wonder why our relationships struggle. Why are, uh, why are we uh, filled with anxiety? We wonder why these things are. God tells us, don't lie. And yet we lie and wonder why we're, we're full of, uh, of such anxiety because we have to constantly juggle the lie. God tells us, don't gossip. He tells us, don't gossip. And yet we do, and we wonder why, when we, we said that thing about that person, it finally gets back around to them, and we wonder why it, it, we, we created a, a mess for ourselves. God tells us not to overindulge in, in alcohol, and yet we drink and drink and drink to the point where we can't even see, and we can't even walk, and we wake up the next morning thinking, man, why did I do that to myself? And yet we do it over and over again. God tells us not to hate our brother, and yet we hate our brother, and we wonder why we have splits in our churches. Some of these trials and tribulations we bring on ourselves because our own sinful desires bring them out in us. These things do not come from God. They are brought on by ourselves. A very wise man once told me, sitting actually uh, in, in uh, uh, the living room just down here off of 111, choices and consequences. And you know what? For many Years after that, and even to this day, Ezra still repeats that phrase. Choices and consequences. See, our choices many times have consequences and, and, and actions that bring forth in us trials and tribulations until it finally brings forth the ultimate consequence. Look at it. Look at the ultimate consequence that it brings in verse 15. Desire, when it has conceived, gives forth birth to sin, and sin, when it has fully grown, what does it bring forth? Death. Romans puts it this way. The wages, or the, the payment for sin, is death. That is what sin brings about in our life. It brings about death and destruction. We've got to sit in that for a second. Because some of us play the victim card quite often. I'm a victim of my circumstances. I'm a victim of this. Guess what? The Bible tells us that it's our own hearts, desires that brings those things out in us. And these things don't come from God. And so we sit in this and we say, well, what, what's the answer, Andrew? We're, I, I, I thought you were going to give me some hope for my trials today. I thought you were going to give me hope for my tribulations today. I thought you were going to help me count it joy when I go through something hard. You see, here's the, here's the joy that we can count it. When we understand this fact, when we understand that sin in our hearts that's brought on by our own stupidity, by our own sinful desires, brings forth and produces in us death, then we can realize that there's joy that can be found at the life giver. Look at verse 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. You see, God is a good God who says, I'm not going to let you be stuck in your trials and tribulations. I'm not going to let you be stuck in the wages of sin is death. I'm going to give you a way out, a gift from me. And this is the gift. You ready? 18. Of his own will, he brought forth us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his, creation, of his creatures. See, God's character is to look at us in our trials and tribulations, ones and messes that we've made ourselves, things that we've done to ourselves, and to look at us and to give us hope and give us salvation in the midst of what the resurrection is all about. It's what the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. Death does not have to be the final word for you. Death does not have to be the final word for me. Yes, sin is going to produce that, but sin ultimately produced the death of our Savior. And guess what? If he had stayed in that grave, we have no hope. But three days later, he defeated all of our greatest enemy, death, forever. And when we believe and trust in Him, we too can escape.
the wages of sin. It paid for us. We've all gone through trials and tribulations in our life. Some of them are to produce in us character. Some of them are to reveal to us that we need God. But ultimately, the trials and tribulations that we bring on ourselves, the temptations that lead to sin, give us uh, our need for who God is. This reminds me of a, a very well-known story, and you know it. You may even know where I'm going to go. Jesus told this story. It was a story of a young man. And he had a dad, and his dad was very wealthy. And he decided one day that he didn't want to wait for his dad to die to get his inheritance. In fact, he, in, by saying that I want you to give my inheritance to me now, he was wishing his dad was dead. And so what does his father do? He says, look, uh, I'm, a good God. I'm a good God. I'm a, I'm a good father. I'm going to give you what you're asking for, but... Know this. You're asking for it. You're the one that's asked for this. And so what does he do? He takes his riches. We know the story. And he blows them on all the things of this world. Any sinful thing that you can think of, he blew it on. Drugs, I'm sure. Alcohol. Parties. Women. Anything that he could get his hands on. He was a popular dude. Why? Because he always put, picked up the tab. People loved him. That is, until he ran out of money. And it tells us, Jesus tells us in this story, that this man ended up having to eat slop out of a pig's sty, out of, a pig's, uh, out of the pig's food, just to survive. And he realizes something. My father has servants. Why don't I just go back to my father's house and beg for a job? That's what I'm going to do. He doesn't have to see me as a son anymore. He doesn't have to see me, uh, as, you know, as, as somebody who, who he cares about. I'll just simply be one of the servants. What happens? He makes the decision that he needs his father. He makes the decision that he can't fix the mess that he's made on his own. And so he goes back. And listen, all of us, this is all of us this morning. We are a son who's made messes of our lives, who have done things that we, we should not have done, who have done things that, we, that have spit in the face of our Father God. And we should be so, I mean, the, the, the psalmist had it right. If I could just be a house, uh, just a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord, just a doorkeeper, if I could just stand at the door and welcome people in, that would be better than a thousand years somewhere else. And that's what this, this son realized. And he realized, I, I, all I have is, is to beg for a job. And so he came down the road, and guess what? That father was sitting, looking down the road. I imagine that father had never left. He, he came out, that was probably his daily routine, to come out and sit on the porch and watch down the road for his son. And all that son had was, please, father, please. And that father ran to him, embraced him. And said, yeah, you made a mess of your life, but I'm going to fix it. Come in. We're going to slaughter the, we're going to celebrate because my son has come home. See, this morning we can count our trials joy when we realize that our father wants us to come home. That he wants to fix the mess that we've made of our life. That he wants to fix the things that we've done in our life. You see, trials can be considered joyous because of a loving Father who will work them out for our good. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you are a good God. And that we can sing of your goodness. Because even when we make a mess, even when we do the thing that you have no, I mean, no obligation to fix, God, you still tell us, I'm willing and ready to fix it. Father, I pray by your Holy Spirit that the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ will penetrate every single heart, soul, and mind in this room today. Father, that whatever they're going through, whether it's a trial that's external to them or whether it's a trial that they've created on their own, 
Father, that that trial would push them into deeper obedience to you, but it would most of all turn them to an, uh, an utter reliance on you to fix our mess. Father, I thank you that you can do that. And I pray that you would do it this morning. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. For his sake. We're going to stand together and we're going to sing <coughs> our closing hymn, it's Pass Me Not. Two things this morning. <coughs> For some of us, we need to get around this altar and we need to receive that forgiveness, receive that <coughs> fixing of our mess. And I'd be glad to show you how. But for some of us this morning, we, we've been a Christian, we've been a believer for a long time, and we need to get around this altar and come home and just and say, God, I need your forgiveness. But for some of us, we've been going through a trial. We've been going through a tribulation. And we need to get around this altar and we need to ask God for wisdom on first how to deal with it, but also how, why we're going through it. That's big enough for all of our questions. Whatever the need, whatever the thing that you need to pray for this morning, we're going to sing, Pass Me Not, you come. I'll be glad to show you. Let's sing together, Pass Me Not.
time. Come and pray. Maybe for somebody that you know that's going through a hard time. Come and pray. Praise God for the Spirit of God in this place this morning. Whether you came forward or whether you didn't, whatever it is, whatever the need, I pray that this week you would take care of it. That you'd realize your trials are things that are drawing you closer to God this morning. Lots of things going on this week. I do want to remind you of the basketball dinner tonight. Uh, next week, or next Sunday, we got a couple things to check your bulletins. The nursery worker meeting, uh, the, uh, the finance meetings on Thursday night. Lots of things in the bulletins to make sure you just know what's going on in our church and the life of our church. And as always, I just want to remind you, I love you. God loves you more. We'll see you next time.